Well, we have been working through a series on spiritual warfare. And we're still in my introduction. <laughs> Some five weeks after I started. I don't think I planned this out well. Um, we have looked at uh, the maxims of war. Know your enemy. Know yourself. Know the battleground. We've talked about the enemy of our soul, the great deceiver, Lucifer, Satan, the fallen angel. We are talking about know yourself, which ironically enough, can be your enemy. Now we've, we've taken a couple weeks, we talked a couple weeks ago about whose you are, how do you know who you belong to. Last week we spent some time talking about um, indwelling sin, being a, a child of the light and yet still having sin in your life. And, and those uh, last week, um, there's some, some kind of heavy stuff that I, I laid on you. This week, I'm hoping, at least in my plan when I wrote it out, when, when I felt like God was leading me, this is going to be a week of encouragement. If, if you met the criterion from the last two weeks. Okay? So this message is directed to <coughs> children of God. Okay? Uh, let me restate this. You guys have heard me say this many times. Not everyone is a child of God. Okay? The world loves to fool you. Oh yeah, we're all God's children. No. John chapter 1 makes it very clear. To them that believe, he gave the right to be called the children of God. Okay? So if you don't believe... You are not his child. As a matter of fact, Jesus makes that abundantly clear too. When speaking to the Pharisees, he says, You are true offspring of your father, the devil. Okay? So this message is not to the children of the devil. Excuse me. I'm going this way because you guys are not the children of the devil. <coughs> the, the, the children of the devil that are out there somewhere. And I'm not saying the children of God here either because we're all children of God, hopefully in this place. So this message is to the children of God. Know yourself. Know your identity. Who are you? I've got a bunch of uh, scriptures here. And if you would like a copy of this afterwards, let me know. I'll give you a copy of my notes so you can kind of go back and hit the scriptures because I'm going to be going through these fairly quickly. First thing... As a believer, you are known by God. <clears throat> now you think, well, he knows everything. Yes, but no. Now, when Jesus was talking on the, the Sermon on the Mount, he said, many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these spectacular and wonderful things in your name? And he will look at them and say, I never knew you. Well, they knew him. They're calling him Lord. But he didn't know them. So as a Christian, as a child of God, you are known by God. You have intimacy with God. You have made yourself available to him. So we see in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3, it says, But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Okay? Do you, you see what the difference is there? There are a lot of people that are acting in, in service to God, still trying to earn their way into heaven, still trying to fulfill the law, and merit some kind of favor by what they do, but they're not known by him. Why? Because they don't love him. It says, if you love God, you are known by God. Galatians chapter 4, verse 9 says, But now that you have come to know God, or rather be known by God, how can you turn back against the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world? Whose slaves you want to be once more? If Paul is laying out a, a very clear principle right here. Look, if you are known by God, if you are one of His, what does the world have to offer you? 
What, what can they give you that's of any value? Money. Oh, yeah, remember what the love of money is? It's the root of all kinds of evil. They can give me security. Really? Did you guys just miss the recession we went through? I mean, millions of dollars. Gone. Just gone. What kind of security is that? Well, I mean, what, what can you put your trust in in this world? But God is always faithful. Always. He said he will never leave you or forsake you. Even when you go through the rough times, which ironically enough, he's putting you through. He is taking you through them. He is going with you. He's putting you through them. Why? So that you can be refined. So the ugliness can be brushed off of you. So you can see the value that he has placed in you. Okay? So to be a child of God is to be known by God. To have intimacy with him. To be open for him. To, to just... Here I am. Bleh. Okay? If you are not bleh with God, you're not being honest. All right? You're not. You think you're hiding anything from him? He already sees it. He sees it better than you do. Okay? So, you know, I, I, have, has anyone here besides me ever yelled at God? Okay. I'll scoot over here so when the lightning strikes. Okay? Because, you know... You fool yourself if you think, oh, oh, no, I would never be angry with God, liar. Okay? God knows you're angry with him. Because you don't understand. God hasn't given us complete understanding. Okay? He doesn't expect us to know everything, otherwise we'd be God. Remember it was the desire of knowledge that got us into trouble in the first place? There are times when I have been very angry with God. I don't like what I'm going through. God, this is uncomfortable. It stinks. Why are you doing this to me? Oh yeah, because he wants me to be better. He, he wants something. He wants a spotless bride presented to him. He, he doesn't want me bringing all my garbage. He wants to weed that out. Okay? He wants to make me better. So, to be known by God, to be intimate with God, to be familiar with God. We talked about this one a little bit last week. You are a new creation. The you that came to the cross, dead and buried and gone. Okay? We talked about this last week. Paul talks about sin that dwells in us. Uh, the nature of sin. We have a capacity to sin, but we are no longer defined by sin. Okay? Our identity is no longer a sinner. You understand that? Because when you were a sinner and then saved by grace, you are now the righteousness of God in Christ. Yeah, you still have the capacity and unfortunately the habit of sin. But that is not counted against you any longer. That's been washed away by the blood of Christ. Once and for all. Done. Perfect sacrifice. Never need be done again. Okay? Now, lest you think I'm foolish, do we continue then on in sin? No. Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, the Greek has no more strong statement to emphasize, No! No! Okay? Should we then continue on in sin? No! Don't! Stop! Okay? So, we are covered by His grace. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. So, a new creation. You're perfect. You're perfect. Before God, you stand absolutely perfect. Not a perfection of your own. Not a perfection of your own. If we have perfection of our own, why would we need the blood of Christ? Okay, we, we don't have perfection of our own. We have perfection that is given us because of Christ. So, um, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14 says, For by a single offering, this being Jesus Christ crucified, he has perfected for all time 
those who are being sanctified. Okay? So, you stand perfect, and He's working holiness in you. You are being made pure. Well, how does that work? He's God. He can do whatever He wants. Okay? This is a thing we don't have to comprehend. We have to accept. You have to believe. Okay? In Hebrews chapter 11, God tells us what, what pleases God. <coughs> Faith. Does understanding please God? Does intelligence please God? Really? Okay, so, so you've got an Einstein IQ. And you're gonna, you think that's going to impress God who knows everything? <coughs> who, who made the laws that you're just now trying to describe and understand? Okay? But faith pleases God. Without faith, you cannot please Him. Okay? So, He has made us perfect. He is sanctifying us, that process whereby we realize first just how horrible and wretched we are and what He has done to save us. So the process of sanctification is bringing us to that we would look like Him. Okay? We are Christians. We are little Christs. We are the image of Christ. We are the body of Christ represented on this earth. Do we make mistakes? You betcha. I make a lot of them. Even when I think I'm doing right, I'm blowing it. <laughs> Just how good I did today, babe. Don't. Pride. <clears throat> Thank God I don't have to stand in that. Thank God I stand in the perfection that he has given me. Okay? So we are at one and the same, same time perfect and being made perfect. We just talked about this. You are the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Who would the him be there? Jesus. Jesus. Okay, wow, that was lame. Who would the him be there? Jesus. Jesus, Jesus thank you. Oh, Jesus. Okay. Uh, he made Jesus to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him, we, who's we? That's us. Okay, you can do for us. That's fine. <clears throat> we might become the righteousness of God. Now, think about that for a minute. I still struggle to wrap my brain about this, okay? You are the righteousness of God. You have the perfection of the Almighty who is absolutely perfect. Can you grasp that? I don't think we really can because we really don't understand what perfection is. I mean, you know, we strive for perfection in this life. As a matter of fact, I've been told, don't try to strive for perfection. It'll never happen. Don't say that to a perfectionist. <laughs> That's like saying, I, I can't even, I don't even know what to compare that to. That's like saying, Kathy, don't drink coffee in the morning. <laughs> That's just wrong, isn't it, Kathy? <laughs> yes, it's just wrong. But God has given us His perfection, His righteousness. And you know what, what's, what's really cool about this? Is it makes you stink. What? How is that cool? Because before the world, you have an odor that they find most unpleasant. Look, if you don't stink before the world, I have to question whether or not you belong to God. Okay? Because he should exude out of you. He should exude out of you. You should find yourself talking and God just slips out. Okay? Now, it is the aroma of life to those that are being saved. Right? Okay? You get around Christians and you, and you just feel... Have you ever been around a Christian that you didn't know was a Christian but you knew was a Christian? Have you ever, you just know. You just, you're around them and you just know that they're a believer. That's, that's the aroma of life, man. That's, that's the, the thing that we should all be getting. 
Was that somebody's phone or is there a bird? That is a loud bird. Okay? The aroma of life. Yes, they'll do it at the Baptist church. <laughs> so we have an odor that comes out from us. Now, the, the, the weird thing about that is, is it's the exact same odor. Okay? But because their senses have not been refined by God's spirit living inside of them, it stinks. Uh, I, I've got some friends from high school on Facebook, and I, I just... Uh, I, I cannot fathom their thinking. I, I just cannot. Some of the things that they post on Facebook, I, I can't believe that they would say, and they, they actually believe. It just it floors me. Some of the stuff that they just put out there as being right and normal, and it's so twisted and perverted, it's disgusting. And I read it and I go, what, where's the little parenthetical statement saying, you know, sarcasm intended, or... or Irony, or, or there's not because they're they're so caught up in what this world has to offer. They believed the lie. Okay, they believed the lie. God is a stench to them. Okay, I mean, think about it. In order to come to Him, you got to go through death and then resurrection into new life. I mean, what about any of this makes sense? Really? I mean, we are completely backwards to the way the world looks at things. All right? We're backwards. In order to be first, we've got to be last. In order to be a leader, you've got to be a servant. In order to live, you've got to die. What about this makes any sense? Without the Spirit of God making it alive to you. If, if it doesn't make sense to you, get with God and find out why. Okay? So, we are an odor of death to the world, but we're the odor of life to each other because we're being saved. Alright? So, do you stink? <clears throat> the righteousness of God. I just spoke about this one a minute ago. You are a child of God. Think about this for a minute. Your <coughs> God is dad. Or, or even in two different passages, it, it refers to daddy. Okay? Abba. Okay? That's intimacy. That's, that's familiarity. That's comfortable. That's climbing up in his lap. Being welcomed into his lap. I love how Jesus so often demonstrated his heart toward children. And the disciples were like, shoot kids, come on, come on, don't bother him. He's like, what are you doing? Bring them to me. Don't you understand that unless you become like them, you can't inherit the kingdom of God? It's given to these. And then, then he doesn't just like bring them up and sit them, you know, they have a little semicircle around Jesus. and have to, No, he picks them up. And he's holding them. And he's loving on them. I can just see, you know, Jesus holding one of these children and he's talking with the Pharisees. just holding the child. And he's talking with the Pharisees about the kingdom of God. And I can see, unless you become like one of these, he hands them to the Pharisee and the Pharisee's like... <laughs> he stinks. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They often do. <clears throat> so, you are a child of God. John 1, 12 and 13 says... But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor by the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. Okay? You are born of God. This is the second birth. Galatians chapter 4, 4 through 6. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law. So that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Okay, a couple of things I love about this. One of the, there's a, a translation that actually reads, but when the time was right. It got perfect in his time. Okay, and man, can you imagine if we got everything when we wanted it, 
and how we thought we should get it, how messed up everything was. <coughs> you, you don't believe me? Look at the spoiled child. <coughs> Watch Willy Wonka in the chocolate factory. <laughs> I want it now! And here, lovely daughter, here, have it. Living in fear of your child? Good grief. I'm not afraid of any of my kids. I'm not afraid of my grandkids. They try, they try to intimidate me. I got some intimidating stares from my grandsons. <laughs> I, uh, I whooped your dad. I still whoop your dad. <laughs> Papa loves you, but Papa doesn't take a lot of guff. I still owe you for a broken leg, bitch. <laughs> So, when the time was right, God sent his son. Right here, we've got an image. I'm going to wrap it up for just a second. A lot of people struggle <coughs> with submission. You know, in our society, we have this mentality, you know, I'm as good as anyone. God's not talking about your, your relative place. He's talking about being like him. <coughs> okay? It's about choosing <coughs> to serve, okay? When you come to God, when you come to Christ, you take on his nature. God sent his son. Now Jesus, who is in his very nature, God, embraced the will of God and allowed himself to become man, that he might redeem us. Um, he was born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Okay? So, and because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son. Okay, see? Now we see the triune God, the Father, the Son who came and redeemed us from the law. And then the spirit of the Son who is sent to live in our hearts and enables us to cry Abba Father Abba Father Abba Father okay. this is submission entrusting yourself to the God who knows everything and whose plans for you are good okay I trust God but I don't trust that person okay God has said he will take care of you. God has said he will be with you. God has said he is your shield and defender. Yeah, that person's going to mess up. We all do. But that does not excuse us from bearing the nature of Christ in ourselves. Submission, submit. I'm not going to submit to anything. I'm not going to submit to anyone. Really? Then you will not go far in the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, you will find yourself opposed by God because God resists the proud. <coughs> okay, that's an active verb. It's not like he's just like, yeah, you know what, I'm not going to talk to you. All right. He's saying, you know what, get in your place, child. It's a lot easier to come to him humble than to have him humble you. All right? That's painful. Okay? So, we see submission in this passage. We see Christ-likeness in this passage. We see that we are children of God. Children. You know, that's just a fascinating concept to me. Um, I read a, an article years ago. Um, it was in the Last Days magazine, Keith Green's magazine. It was talking about the Father heart of God. <coughs> and um, I, I, I'm living testimony to this. Basically, Keith Green's opinion was that um, we tend to take the image that we have of our earthly father and superimpose it over our heavenly father. And how that's wrong. Because our earthly fathers are flawed. Okay? They're, they're no more perfect than we are. Um, my, my dad's view of fathering was training recruits for the military. 
Okay, that, that's how he related to us for most of my life until he came to know the Lord. You know, he, he was the drill sergeant and I was the recruit that needed to be disciplined and taught how to do things. And, and that's, that was the relationship that my dad had with me and my siblings. Okay. And so when I looked at God, and, and oftentimes when I still look at God, I tend to look at him as the stern disciplinarian, the God who stands like this. You know, my dad had to do this to get everybody's attention in the house. He'd be sitting in his chair reading his paper. And he could do this. And everybody in the house went silent. Okay, is he thinking about what he's reading? Or am I in trouble? Okay. So, the father heart of God, but is that truly the nature of God? No, it's not. But that's what God intended fathers to be, as representations of him to their children. <coughs> My prayer, every day I pray for my grandchildren. I pray for their salvation every day. Christy and I pray together for their salvation every day. But as part of that, I pray for their parents that God would give them godly, supernatural wisdom to raise up their children in righteousness, to make knowing God such an easy thing that like Timothy, when, when the message of Christ came to him, he was so well versed in the scriptures, he knew so well what was being said that he immediately understood it and was able to embrace it. Okay? I pray that over my children so that they will be that for their children. Because I understand what a great responsibility it is to be a mom and a dad. Especially in this society that we live in now that is just, you know, it started off as kind of a slow spiral, you know, when you unplug your tub and the water starts to go down and it starts off in a slow spiral and then it starts going faster and faster and faster. We're in faster and faster and faster right now, folks. Okay? We have things that are being decided in this country that are so antithetical to God, so, so opposed to righteousness, <coughs> so against morality, all in the name of goodness, fairness, Okay? And we are spinning quickly and quickly and quickly. And, you know, I, I... Look at the front of your bulletin. I put a passage on there. I want, I want to make a point about it real quick here. <clears throat> you are a chosen race. Okay, well, first, who is you? Who, who is the you being talked about here? Yeah. Believers. That's right. The children of God. Okay? So if you are not a child of God, this doesn't apply. <laughs> but as a child of God, this applies. You are a chosen race. A royal priesthood. Now, now think about this for a minute. Both of those are things that are directly taken from the nation of Israel. A chosen race. God chose them. Said, you will be mine. No, he doesn't pass on predestination. No, he doesn't. God made the entire nation of Israel his, but they still had to choose whether or not to serve him. Okay? So a chosen race, a royal priesthood. Now think about this for a minute. In the nation of Israel, one tribe was set apart for God, and only one family from that tribe was given the right to be priests. Okay? The Levitical priesthood. They were given the right, the privilege, of serving God. Now, we are being called a royal priesthood. A holy nation. A holy nation. Think about that for a minute. There is no such thing as a Christian American. <gasps> Didn't you know we're the greatest Christian nation in the world? There is no Christian nation. There is no Christian nation. The Christian nation is Christian nation. And your fellow nationalites are in every nation that this world has. Okay? 
So when we're talking about, oh, you know, I'm an American Christian, think about what it means to be an American. Okay, I'm not, I'm not slamming our country. I think our country has done incredible things. I still think the Constitution is one of the greatest documents of government ever to be written. Okay? So don't, I'm not bashing America. But I want you to understand is that if you put being an American in any way on a level with being a Christian, you're doing an incredible disservice to being a Christian. Okay? Now, as an American... You've got the right to worship whoever you will. That's not what a Christian is. As an American, you have certain rights and privileges. Hey, nobody better than you. What does God say? Consider others better than yourself. We can sit down and just go through everything that it means to be a, to be a Christian and, and juxtaposition it next to everything it means to be an American. And you know what? They don't match. They don't match. There is no nation in the world that in order to be a, a good national citizen of that nation that it will line up with being a good Christian. Okay? Now, we have liberties and freedoms in this country that make it incredibly easy for us to be Christian. I, unfortunately, I think that's a bad thing. <clears throat> You know where some of the greatest revivals are happening in the world today? It is not in America. Do you realize that America is now receiving more missionaries than we're sending? Do you understand what that means? That there are Christian people out there that are looking at America and looking at us as unreached peoples. That, that, that need the gospel. So we are receiving more missionaries coming into America than we are sending out. Okay? Where are the greatest revivals taking place? They're taking place in countries where Christians are being persecuted. Persecuted. Everybody's keeping track of ISIS, right? I mean, they're in the news. They're everywhere. But what the news is not reporting is that one of the greatest revivals is happening in Iran. Thousands of people are coming to salvation in Iran, which is the hotbed, looks like the, the, the father figure for Muslims and Islam. And, and they're realizing after how many decades, what, what are we, three decades since Ayatollah took over Iran? Three and a half decades? They're realizing that all that they've been given is empty and, and, and there's nothing to it. And they want something that's going to give their lives meaning. We have brothers and sisters in Iran. We have brothers and sisters who are being tortured, separated from their families, abused, and executed because they refuse to profane the name of Christ. And we're worried that somebody might not like us because we proclaim the name of Christ. <laughs> A couple of weeks ago in Brothers Meeting, we talked about the rapture. When is the rapture going to be? I, I, I don't care if you believe pre-trib or <coughs> post-trib. That's not my point here. My, my point is this. When Christ comes back, he is coming back for a bride that is spotless. And if you look in the New Testament, in order to purify, there had to be fire. There had to be hardship. There had to be tough stuff to weed out all the dross and all the garbage. So I don't care if you believe that he is coming pre-trib and you're going you're gonna to be out of the entire tribulation. Quite honestly, I hope that's the case. I don't want to go through any of that. But I'll tell you what, it is going to get so ugly leading up to the tribulation. The church is going to suffer such persecution on a global scale that those who do not believe unto salvation will fall away. They'll fall away. How many churches in America today are embracing the cultural crap that they're being fed? Things that fly openly in the face 
of God's written word to us. And it used to be that they were trying to manipulate the word to make it fit with the culture. Now they're just throwing it out. They're just throwing the word out. Oh, that's not for today. That's a good allegorical system. It teaches a good basis for morality. But that was really culturally relevant to the culture at the time it was written. It's not culturally relevant to us. Why? Because we like sin. <coughs> really? This is what the church is putting out there? A holy nation. Holy. That means dedicated unto God. Okay? A people for his own possession. I love this verse. I love this verse. We belong to him. We are his priests. We are his possession. We are his nation. You want to have national pride? Have national pride in being a Christian. Okay? Okay? But please, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, it, it's bad to be patriotic for your country. I, I'm not. I'm saying don't let that compete with being devoted to God. Don't confuse the two, okay? There's a very clear delineation there, all right? When Jesus came and, and he ministered to all of the people in, in Galilee, in Samaria, in Judah, Judea, he didn't tell them, you know, oh, you, you gotta quit being a, a Samaritan, you gotta quit being a this. He didn't tell the, the Roman centurion, you gotta quit being a Roman centurion, you, you gotta be a Jew. He didn't do that. Okay? So I'm not telling you you've got to quit being an American. I'm saying make being a Christian more important than being an American. Okay? Okay. So moving forward. <clears throat> uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Okay? So, a, a couple of things here I want to point out. Do you realize you were saved out of slavery? That before Christ, you were a slave to sin. We, we addressed this a little bit last week. Last, the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is you can choose not to sin as a Christian. Okay? You can choose not to embrace sin as a Christian. As a non-Christian, you can't. Because what righteous act can a non-Christian do? <coughs> Even the righteousness is spoiled before God because their very nature is that of a sinner. Okay? So we, are, uh, we did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption of sons. Now the word there, sons, and, and several times in the verses I've read, sons. That word in the Greek is adelphoi, and it means siblings, children. Okay? It, we translate it as sons, because that's easier for us to understand, but it's, it's sons and daughters. Okay, so don't get up and say, oh, see, God only likes the boys. Okay? You, you, you know what? Because we're a lot easier to understand. It's black and white for boys. <laughs> I could present every one of my boys with the same question a hundred times, and a hundred times they each give me back the same answer. I present the same question to my daughter a hundred times, and I get a hundred different answers. And each one longer than the last. <laughs> okay? God does not love men any more than he loves women. Okay? God is not a chauvinist. There is no favoritism in him. As a matter of fact, Scripture tells us that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female. Okay? We are all of equal value and esteemed so much that he shed his blood for all of us. Okay? So, children of God, we have the spirit of sonship. So let's, let's look at this real quick. I want to just kind of remind you. We are known by God. We are a new creation. You are perfect and being made perfect. You are the righteousness of God. You are a child 
of God, and you are a co-heir with Christ. Now, you guys have really, we have got to grasp what it means to be a Christian. Because that's one of the fundamental things that the enemy really works hard to deceive us about. He works very hard to lie to us about our relative position and all that we are in God. Okay? He, oh, God can't love you that much. Look at all the sin you have in your life. God, God, God. I mean, God detests sin. How could he ever love you that much? God doesn't want to hang out with you. God doesn't want to be intimate with you. Your prayers are a waste of time. Your prayers are a waste of time. Going to church, you don't need to go to church. It can just be you and God. And, and, and I've noticed that when it's just you and God, it tends to be just you. You don't need fellowship. He attacks us at the very nature of what God has made us and is making us into. What is the opposite of faith? Fear. Doubt, unbelief, fear. And those are all things that the enemy is sowing to put a barrier between us and our Heavenly Father who loves us with the perfect love that is not based on how good we are or more often aren't. It is based on his very nature. Fear. What did, what did we just read here? Let me read that verse again. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back <coughs> into fear. How many of you have fear in your lives. You don't have to put your hands up. Okay? I do. That's one of the things I really struggle with. One of the things that I, I really, really struggle with is as the father image of God, the father heart of God that I was dealing with is uh, I worked very hard to please my dad. Okay? And there were things that I knew that pleased my dad I was not good at. I had brothers that were good at I had a sister that was good at but I was not good at The things that I was good at never really seemed to please my father. Okay? And one of the things that, that carries over into my relationship with God is I work really hard, oftentimes very unconscious of, of it, to please him. I want to make sure that he's pleased with what I'm doing. And I forget that he's already pleased with me. The fact that I have salvation proves that he is pleased with me because you cannot get salvation without faith and faith pleases God. Okay? So if you have fear in your life, especially in relationship, uh, in, in your relationship with God, that's from the devil. Okay? That's a lie that is being sown into your heart and your mind to make you doubt, to drive you away from him, to keep you from embracing everything that he has for you. Okay? So co-heirs with Christ. What is an heir? <clears throat> Somebody give us a working definition so we understand what's being said here. Successor. What? Successor. A successor? Okay. If I am an heir to the Van Note fortune, what does that mean? Descendant. <coughs> okay. I will receive it. Now, I have no idea if there's a Van Note fortune. My hope is I don't inherit the Van Note debts. <laughs> okay. But an inheritor is someone who receives the blessings from those that went before, or in this case, the one who is always God. So when we're talking about being a co-heir with Christ, that means you get what he gets. 
Think about that for a moment. Let that soak into your brain. Galatians chapter 4, verse 7. For you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Now catch this. This is important. Provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. One of the things that really gets my goat and will really get me going is the prosperity gospel. Health and wealth. Look. God wants you to be content where he has you with what he's given you. All right? If you catch that, he wants you to be content. Whether you have little or whether you have much, be content. You know, I've got a very simple definition for the American dream. You ready? It's really complicated. It's really long. More. The American dream is more. More than my parents had, more than my neighbors have, more than I have right now. The American dream is all about more. And really, the American dream is based on discontent. Not being satisfied with where you are. Okay? As a Christian, we are called to suffer. We are called to a world that hates us because it hated him. We are called to put our lives out there that the light would shine forth in dark places. Remember the little song you used to sing in Sunday school? Can she sing it for us? No, she, she can, but she's not prepared. <laughs> this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel? No. Are you letting your light shine? Are, are people frustrated with you because all you want to talk about is God? And, and somehow or another, in every conversation, God works his way into it. Beautiful weather today. Yeah, isn't God good? Boy, the weather stinks. God's still good. Broncos lost again. God never leaves. <laughs> Seahawks won the Super Bowl. Even a pig finds a pearl. <laughs> no. Honestly, some of the, the testimonies I've read about the Seahawks, I think there's some incredible people in that organization. I like to poke fun at it, mostly because Trevor was such a diehard fanatic that the time I really liked to poke Trevor. And it didn't matter to me because he didn't have a favorite hockey team and so, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's the Avs, so you know, they kind of stink. That's the measure of a true fan. Are you sticking with them when they lose? So, co-heirs with Christ. We are inheritors of everything that Christ was given. But, but Romans makes it very clear. Suffering is part of it. Suffering. Now, to be honest with you, in this country, the measure of suffering that we're going to have to go through at this point is really not that much. So what, they, they might not want to hang around with you? Really are the people you should be hanging around with anyway? They're not going to like you? Great! Because if they like you but hate Jesus, <coughs> then they're not seeing Jesus in you. Okay, so, so that's, that's a win-win situation. That, that, that's not really suffering compared to some of the things that we see going on around the world. I mean, I mean, how many of us have lost everything we possess because we believe in Christ? We see entire cities over in the Middle East where every Christian in the city is given a choice. Convert, leave, or die. 
and then they did it really cool, pay the tax, and then die. Okay? So, being an heir means that you get all that Jesus got, but we're not working for rewards on earth. We're working for eternal rewards in heaven where there's no, well, you know, it technically doesn't say there's no moths. It says they won't destroy. Okay? But I, does that mean there's moths in heaven? I don't know. I mean, they're, they're one of God's creations, so I don't know why they wouldn't be. But, um, where are you building your home? Where are you investing your time and your energy? Where, what are you putting your efforts into building? Are you building a comfortable life here on this earth? Or are you building a mansion in heaven? Are you building a, a treasure in heaven that you can cast at his feet when you, when you come before him and he rewards you for all that you've done on his behalf and then you can take that whole thing and lay it down at his feet? Or are you, you going to be the one that you know reaches in your pocket for the bent penny? Oh, here's what I got, God. Hey, you're in heaven. It's a lot better place than the alternative. But man, I want to have a lot of things to lay at his feet. I want to stand before him and have him say, well done. Well done. That's what drives me. I want my father to be pleased with me. And I know he is. But I want to do more. Father, we bless you today. Father, for all that you have made us into and are making us into. Father, that we are your children, sons and daughters that you love, desperately, deeply, eternally love, unconditionally. Father, that you have made a way where there was no way before. That you have made it possible us to come directly into your presence where father before you were separated from us the veil has been rent we can come boldly before your throne of grace we can look to you and we can cry Abba father <coughs> we can feel your arms around we can know that you are defending us. That you only allow what is necessary for our growth, for our maturity, for the building of our faith. And even in the midst of that, you accompany us. You prepare a way before us you walk alongside of us and you guard our rear side, Father. You protect us. Shelter us, Father. Help us to be bright, shining, brilliantly shining lights. Father, that as we go forth, we would take all that you've given us and we'd go out into a world. Father, that Jesus Community Church would be a place that goats come in and are transformed miraculously, instantaneously into sheep. Father, that we would have courage to testify what you have done for us. All that you have given us. And even in that, Father, your word tells us that you will give us what to say. Bless you, Father, and I thank you for your steadfast love. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>